Hello, and welcome to your pediatric resuscitation uh, pre-course review. My name is Dwayne Cattell. I'm one of the regional paramedic educators for the base hospital program. So what are our objectives here today? Uh, when we complete this webinar, uh, we should be able to describe the BLS standards for managing pediatric patients in cardiac arrest. Uh, we're going to demonstrate the application of clinical consideration for early transport for patients less than 18 years of age and actually talk about and review and demonstrate the uh, medical cardiac arrest directive uh, as it relates to pediatric patients. So speaking specifically about pediatric cardiac arrest, it's usually asphyxial uh, type of cardiac arrest uh, and noting that the majority of these kids end up, or pediatric patients, are not in shockable rhythm. So V-fib arrests are very, very rare in the pediatric patients. You're seeing more of asystole and PEAs. So the most important intervention as per AHA guidelines is adequate CPR and minimal time off of the chest. Uh, often the key to a successful resuscitation with a pediatric cardiac arrest is performing excellent CPR. So going over our BLS uh, care, essentially starting with airway, uh, head, head tilt uh, chin lift method is the preferred method. Uh, always being aware that pediatric patients have a big tongue. Uh, so the displacement of the mandible, forward displacement of the jaw is, is critical. Um, and we want to avoid extreme hyperextension um, of the neck uh, due to possible neck injury. Uh, and we can also use a jaw thrust in these cases. So next we'll uh, go to breathing. Uh, look, listen, and feel for about 10 seconds. Uh, remember children, uh, pediatric patients are underventilated. We don't want to over bag uh, these kids or over ventilate these patients. Ensure the proper rate of ventilation for the age of the child. Uh, limit the volume. Uh, we only want the, to get good chest rise and always utilize the equipment, the proper equipment that's sized for that patient and that would be supplied by your service. So continuing with breathing, remember we don't want to use a demand valve on children um, and we always try to ensure the proper compression ventilation ratio. So what is the best sign of effective ventilation with pediatric patients and that is good chest rise and fall. So regarding oxygen therapy in the pediatric cardiac arrest, uh, we want to initiate that as soon as possible. Uh, try to delay. Try not to delay that. Um, use high, the 100% oxygen high flow to uh, when they are in cardiac arrest. And there's evidence has shown there is no uh, risk in short-term use. So going through our ABCs, we're now up to circulation. So doing our pulse check for our infants, uh, checking the uh, brachial pulse. Um, and then with children, we're checking either the carotid or femoral. So when are we gonna start compressions? Um, in kind of a general overview uh, with the neonates, if the heart rate is less than 60, um, and after uh, ventilating the patient uh, with room air for 30 seconds and it's still less than 60, we would hook up oxygen start compressing. For infants, children, and adults, if there is no pulse, then we start compressing. So in regards to uh, supporting circulation and doing chest compressions for an uh, infant, um, it's a two finger technique, uh, one finger width below the nipple line, um, and you're going to compress about one third to one half of the chest wall depth. Okay, and we want to maintain a compression rate of a minimum 100 compressions per minute. So talking about uh, compressions for a child, it's a two-handed technique, it's two-handed CPR. 
the compression depth is one third to one half the overall chest wall depth um, and it's located in the center of the chest as you would with an adult right on the body of the sternum and the compression rate for children should be at least 100 compressions per minute. So what is the best sign of effective uh, compressions? Is if you can palpate a pulse with each compression. So speaking in regards to defibrillation with pediatric patients, uh, very, very rare that a uh, patient will be in V-fib or pulseless VTAC. Uh, the majority of the time, pediatric patients are found, 90% of the time, they're found in either asystole or their PEA. So, speaking of ventricular fibrillation, what would be some of the predisposing factors? Um, why you'd find a pediatric patient in V-fib? Uh, is a uh, drug overdose is a toxicity, some type of electrocution injury, uh, either high or low voltage, um, electrolyte imbalance, or a congenital heart defect. So in regards to pad positions for pediatric defibrillation, you can either place the pads anterior or posterior, so basically making a baby sandwich, or you can go anterolateral. Um, but we always try to adhere to the manufacturer's recommendations for your pads. So one important note, um, if you're using adult pads to defibrillate pediatric patients, uh, according to the directive, then ensure that there is some spacing between the pads to avoid any arcing of energy over top of the patient. And as well, um, check the manufacturer's suggested uh, guidelines for weights and ages uh, in regards to pad application. So, talking about the uh, 2012 medical cardiac arrest directives, um, manual defibrillation applies to patients 30 days of age and greater. Uh, SAD mode applies to patients 30 uh, days of age and greater. As well as um, in patients uh, that are uh, 30 days to just less than 8 years, uh, reduced energy level uh, settings are also available. Um, services in uh, our region are currently, there's one of three choices the services have to go with. Um, the first one is you're defibrillating your pediatric patient through uh, pediatric sized pads with attenuated cables or your service is involved in a manual defibrillation program or the third one is that if reduced energy is not available or uh, not applicable for the service then you use adult pads and utilize adult energy settings. So our pediatric defibrillation options are either using, utilizing attenuation cables, uh, utilizing manual defibrillation process, or an SAED um, with uh, no attenuator cable. So basically adult pads with adult energy settings. So when we're talking about attenuator cables, this would apply to patients uh, 30 days of age and up to eight years of age. Um, and the reduced level energies are using the attenuator cables and it's a semi-automatic analysis, just push the analyze button and the energy would be delivered through the attenuator cables. And always adhere to your service policy and the manufacturer's recommendations for those particular for that for those particular uh, defibrillator pads. So carrying on with the attenuator cables, and remember that when you're defibrillating these patients, the cables automatically reduce the energy down. Uh, so the ratio being delivered is four to one. So when it's shocking at 200 joules, the actual amount of energy being delivered is only 50 joules. Remember as well that when you're using attenuator cables, um, you cannot defibrillate in manual mode. So now we'll move on and talk about uh, the use of manual energy, so manual defibrillation. Uh, manual defibrillation applies to patients uh, 30 days of age 
uh, and greater and this is service specific so follow the guidelines and the training program you went through with your service so when we're in manual mode for shocking pediatric patients what's our procedure so we turn the machine on obviously um, start CPR get the machine turned on uh, apply the pads either uh, anterior posterior anterior lateral um, you're going to confirm uh, visually uh, V-fib or pulses VTAC. You're going to uh, charge up the machine. So that's either done by um, pressing the energy select button uh, or dialing it in, depending on which defibrillator you have. Uh, generally, starting at, you'll start at 2 joules per kilogram. You're going to uh, charge up the machine and you make sure everybody is clear to ensure patient safety, your safety, and bystander safety. So continuing on with the defibrillation procedure, um, confirming the rhythm the whole time the machine is charging, making sure the machine is charged up, um, making sure everybody's clear, and deliver the shock, pressing the shock button, um, if you want to dump the charge for whatever reason, say the rhythm's converted, or you actually feel a pulse, a palpable pulse, um, with the, the life pack, physical control, the LP15s or LP12s, you'll press the selector knob, and that will dump the charge. Um, or with the Zoles, there's an auto dump after a certain amount of time. Um, and you just continue on with your uh, cardiac arrest protocol and if a shock has been delivered in manual mode at two joules per kilogram all the other subsequent shocks will be at four joules per kilogram once again when you're in manual mode if you have a manual defibrillation program at your service um, the initial joule setting will be at two joules per kilo for the first shock and the subsequent shocks will all be at four joules per kilo So one important note, um, not all machines will dial in exactly uh, to the exact energy setting you need. If that's the case, always go up to the next higher energy level setting. And a uh, Joule calculation chart is also another option. So here is your Joule calculation chart. Um, it also uh, notes, denotes that there is the uh, de determining the patient's weight two times your age plus 10, and your first shock would be at two joules, and all your other subsequent shocks would be at uh, four joules. Um, as well, if you can't dial in the energy um, for whatever reason exact, it is appropriate to utilize this Joule calculation chart. The services in this region uh, under Southwestern Ontario Regional Base Hospital Program uh, all who are utilizing manual defibrillation all have these charts and it's up to the service some services uh, will have a chart tagged to your defib um, some people some places were given laminated cards but is the responsibility of the medic and the service to uh, if you're using the chart to have those present and readily ready to go So the third and final option for defibrillation pediatric patients is with using adult pads with adult energy settings. So if reduced energy settings are not available, i.e. with attenuator cables or with manual defibrillation, uh, a paramedic can use adult pads with adult energy settings. Uh, and this is basically from 30 days up to eight years for the pediatric patient. Um, so the pads can be, the adult pads can be used on the pediatric patient just ensure that the pads do not come into contact with each other. There is some space between the pads. So now we're going to go over a few of the teaching points that's been discussed in class. Uh, and we're going to talk about initiation uh, and when to transport these pediatric patients. And there's a few different circumstances. So the first circumstance with a primary care paramedic, uh, if the analyze has been pressed four times and the appropriate response has been taken. Um, oh, and always remember, this includes first responders. If they have shocked the patient or there have no, if they've had no shocks, um, 
delivered, then you can actually count that towards your uh, cardiac arrest um, algorithm, like your directive of the total of four, as long as the story is clear. Uh, the second uh, thing is when, in an unusual circumstance, uh, patients less than 18 years of age, the first no shock you receive, um, you can get out of there. Your on scene protocol is done. Um, first no shock or first non shockable manual rhythm analysis. If it's if it's not V fib or pulses V tac, first no shock you get. On scene protocol is done. Get that child in the truck and get moving. So the third time you would transport the third condition that you would transport this patient under is if you have resuscitated the patient and there is you have the presence of a ROSC, a return to spontaneous circulation. Uh, and the fourth one is is if you've done a base hospital patch, um, this is kind of mostly geared to the ADCPs, you've 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 met the criteria to call to patch in um, and uh, you've told the base hospital physician what's going on and then the doctor orders you to transport the patient. So a couple of clinical considerations um, is that when we're uh, paramedics will transport after the first non-shockable rhythm analysis or interpretation or no shock advised or following the delivery of four shocks. Uh, remember the preferred method is not to stay on scene with these patients, uh, pediatric patients especially. Um, first no shock you received or you determined that it is a non-shockable uh, rhythm analysis for the people certified in manual defibrillation. Load and go um, after you interpret that rhythm and get moving to the hospital. So a couple other teaching points here. Um, that have still stood firm is that say you get a ROSC on scene or in the back of the truck en route to the hospital and then the patient re-arrests um, you're going to bring the truck the ambulance over to the side of the road you're going to stop you're going to analyze the rhythm and if it's a shock rhythm you're going to defibrillate continue on with CPR transport no further stops if it's a non shockable rhythm uh, through manual analysis or through um, SAD mode, it's a no shock indicated, you'll check for a pulse. If there is no pulse, continue CPR and no more pullovers, no more further analysis. So just uh, reviewing the CPR standards for pediatric patients. If you're performing two rescuer, it's uh, a 15 to 2 ratio, 15 compressions um, and two uh, ventilations. If you're a single rescuer, it's 30 to 2, so 30 compressions and two ventilations. Um, and remember that uh, pediatrics, um, if the heart rate is less than 60 with signs of hypoperfusion, so some examples of hypoperfusion would be they're unconscious, uh, they're bronypnic or apneic, obviously bradycardic, hypotensive, uh, cold cyanotic skin, or worst case scenario, they're gray, they're acidotic. If that's the case, with a heart rate less than 60 with signs of hyperperfusion, um, you're going to continue CPR to maintain perfusion. And that occurs up until the age of puberty. If you think that child has not hit that stage of life yet, continue compressing. So if you have any questions uh, regarding these directives or any of the medical directives, uh, please feel free to contact any one of the regional paramedic educators uh, listed on your screen. Thank you.